Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Side Business School. And um, thank you very much for coming and participating in our Inspiring Women series of events we're holding this month um, as part of our celebration of um, International Women's Day, or in this case, it's International Women's Month for us here at the school. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Renee Adams, our keynote speaker today. Um, Professor Adams joined our school last September, beginning of the academic year, and in fact she was so sought after that our Dean flew down um, all the way to the University of New South Wales to try and encourage her to come to the school. Um, she's our Professor of Finance here at the school and um, her work focuses very much on um, gender diversity, um, governance on boards, um, etc. So we're really thrilled to have her here. And I have to say, um, having had the privilege of sitting in on a couple of her presentations, um, one which was particularly on uh, female artists and how they command completely different um, prices to male artists, I think you're going to be in for a treat this evening um, on her um, topic, Women on Boards, the Superheroes of Tomorrow. Um, one of the things that uh, Renee sent me was that um, apparently her paper on female directors, which was published in the Journal of Financial Economics, is the most cited paper on female directors from a journal in the FT50, um, and it has 839 sites. And the next most cited paper on women on boards is only uh, 385. So that is amazing, well done. I also think that this topic is absolutely perfect for the International Women's Day theme this year, which is Balance for Better. So um, please join me in welcoming Renee to the floor. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, for that um, introduction. Um, it's great to see so many superhero fans. So um, you know, I, I know I'm in good company. Uh, so uh, just a couple of words, why superheroes? Uh, so first, um, my son and I, my son's coming later. He's outside eating pizza. But um, uh, we're both like major superhero fans. Um, you know, so we've seen like every superhero movie. There's like what Iron Man, Iron Man Two, Iron Man Three, uh, Captain America, Captain America Civil War, um, the Hulk. There's Venom. That uh, you know, so all guys, right? Um, so I like the guys superhero movies, but um, I was very happy when Wonder Woman came out. Um, and uh, this weekend, uh, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be watching uh, Captain Marvel, which is going to be released on March 8th, perfect for International Women's Day, right? So um, that's what I'm going to be doing. Okay, so, um, uh, so I love superheroes, but um, there is a, a broader context in which superheroes are important uh, for the talk I'm giving today. Uh, so why superheroes? And uh, to uh, motivate the theme, let me read you this quote, which comes from a document by the European Commission uh, that was proposing that um, companies in the EU set uh, targets for their boards in terms of gender diversity. OK, so this quote is um, as follows. Uh, Indeed, there is a clear business case for greater gender diversity on corporate boards, both from the microeconomic perspective, i.e. in terms of individual companies' performance, as well as from a macroeconomic perspective, i.e. in terms of higher sustainable rates of economic growth. Okay. And then uh, the European Commission goes on to uh, cite the following benefits of having women on boards. So the microeconomic benefits are um, first, improved company performance, uh, second, mirroring the market, um, enhanced quality of decision making, improved corporate governance and ethics, uh, better use of the talent pool, um, and it doesn't stop there. There are also macroeconomic benefits of having women on boards. Um, so having a woman on the board creates incentives for women to stay in the workforce, uh, thereby helping to create stronger economies. Um, and it helps countries achieve higher sustainable rates of economic growth. So um, I look at this list of everything that the female directors are supposed to accomplish, and um, clearly they have to be superheroes, <laughs> right? So I mean, you know, it, you know, you don't need to um, uh, deal with um, unemployment. You just put women on boards, and then economic growth goes up, right? So, 
All right, so uh, let's take this a bit seriously. Um, maybe this is an interesting idea that women uh, are superheroes. Like, maybe they are, right? So um, the first, I'm going to address four questions in this talk. Uh, the first question is, can women on boards be superheroes? Uh, second one is, are women on boards superheroes? The two are not the same, right? Whether they can and whether they are. Um, if they're not currently superheroes, why are they not superheroes? Uh, and um, can current policies help address any problems, uh, any sort of impediments to women being superheroes? Okay, so the first question, uh, can female directors actually save the world? Okay, uh, so here's my board, right? And you know, this guy over there is like, well, is this woman really Captain Marvel in disguise? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what are the characteristics of a superhero? If you think about a superhero, and my boy has now um, come into the room, <laughs> and I coached him on this in the ride over here. <laughs> and what's the thing that I said that a superhero is? Brave, yes, that's a good one, okay. Um, uh, but the one that I was looking for was risk taking, right? So, so superheroes take risk, right? Um, what else might you think of as a superhero characteristic? So, what's that? Powerful, right, powerful. Um, independent, independent minded, yes. Um, what about um, in terms of like, what is their objective? What do they want to do? Save, save the world, right? They want to save the world. So um, maybe they should have empathy. Maybe they should care about other people, right? Okay, so you think superhero, you sort of say, okay, I can think of some characteristics that these superheroes uh, might have. And can female directors uh, sort of embody these characteristics? Well, let's take a look. Um, and uh, so I'm going to look at this question, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a scale of uh, characteristics uh, that are the, um, these are human values according to Schwartz. So Schwartz is a psychologist, um, and he developed this scale of human values. According to the Schwartz scale, there are 10 human values. Um, and uh, these are the names of the human values. And the way that I've ordered them is um, uh, I would imagine that superheroes have more of everything up here uh, and less of everything down here. Okay, so here in this box, that's security. Uh, so how security oriented you are, that's related to risk. So I would imagine that superheroes um, are not obsessive about um, uh, being very secure, right? Because they go out and like fight monsters, right? Uh, and you can't fight monsters if you're very secure. So uh, superheroes would have less security orientation, uh, but they would be very probably benevolent and universalist relates to caring about the broader community, right? Okay, so um, now I just said superheroes should be, you know, less uh, risk averse, right? Uh, now, is this how we typically think about female directors? Uh, and let me just read you uh, this quote from a Credit, uh, Credit Suisse report. Um, the Credit Suisse report says, the inclusion of more women in decision-making roles has been a notable outcome of the 2008 financial crisis and the recognition of the downside risk management focus of women. Okay, well, it's a bit of a problem, right? Because I think superheroes are, um, you know, people who go out and take lots of risk, um, they're supposed to save the world, right? According to what the European Commission says. Uh, but yet, um, everyone's going around saying that, um, you know, women on boards, uh, you know, they're so great because they don't take any risk. Seems like it's incompatible, right? Okay, so, well, fortunately, um, you know, that's a Credit Suisse report. Uh, we can go beyond what Credit Suisse does and um, look at the data. Okay, and we can actually measure uh, whether women on boards take more risk or not. Okay, uh, so this is what we did. A co-author of mine did this. Uh, we did a survey in Sweden. Uh, we surveyed all directors of listed companies in Sweden. Um, one very good thing about doing this in Sweden is, um, for some reason, Swedes like to respond to surveys. <laughs> so, you know, um, if you have ever done a survey and um, you think your response rate is good, come and talk to me. I mean, our response rate is amazing, okay? Uh, which is good because it means that uh, the data is very representative, 
Okay, uh, and I'm going to show you the data for Sweden. If you say, "Ah, oh, well, Sweden," you know, and believe me that the journals did say this. They said, "Well, who cares about Sweden, right?" So um, I have other data. Okay, uh, but I'll show you the Swedish data because um, it's the most representative. Okay, and what I've done is I've taken the 10 human values according to Schwartz. Okay, um, and I've plotted the mean values of the values for the male directors and the female directors in our sample. So we asked, we basically sent this questionnaire, we tried to measure uh, human values according to Schwartz, and uh, the zeros represent the men, um, and the ones represent the women, okay? And now this right here is zero, so if you're to the right of zero, that means you have more of that particular value. If you're to the left, it means you have less of that particular value, okay? Uh, so let me just walk you through this. Uh, so basically up here, what this tells you is um, men are slightly more achievement oriented than women. Okay, and these are all directors. Okay, uh, this says that the women are significantly more achievement or uh, benevolent uh, than the men, right? So uh, the women are roughly, you know, this is roughly 50% of this. Uh, here, this says that the women are less conformist than the men. Okay, uh, the women are more hedonist than the men. That might be surprising to some, but think superheroes, okay. Um, the uh, women are less power oriented than the men. The women are less security oriented than the men. The women are more self-directed than the men. The women are more stimulation oriented than the men. They're less tradition oriented than the men, and they're significantly more universalist oriented than the men. Okay. And then we had another question. Those were the Schwartz human values. And then we also asked a question um, about risk. Uh, so we had here, we have security, which is one measure of risk um, aversion. Uh, here we have another one, which is based on a lottery question. Uh, and um, the more the bar is to the right, the more risk averse you are. That's how the scale is set up. Uh, and again, the, the one is the women and the zeros are the men. So the women are less risk averse than the men. Okay. So um, what does the data tell us about uh, whether female directors are superheroes or have the characteristics of superheroes? Um, so the way I would classify superheroes, um, I would say, well, superheroes would be more achievement, benevolent, hedonistic. Uh, the reason I have hedonism here is because um, Iron Man is pretty hedonistic. Um, and so maybe that might be a good characteristic to have as a superhero. Um, more universalist, more self-directed, and more stimulation-oriented than the typical person. Um, but less conformist, less power, oriented, less security oriented, and less tradition oriented. Um, so of course you can have a different classification, but I think that sort of makes a lot of sense. Uh, now look, let's look at the female directors. Um, so female directors have more benevolence, hedonism, self-direction, stimulation, and universalism. Basically all of these characteristics, they have more of these than the male directors. And uh, they are less conformist, power-oriented, security-oriented, and tradition-oriented, consistent with this category. Um, so basically, the only one where they don't exhibit the major superhero characteristic is achievement, where they're slightly less achievement-oriented than the men. But if you go back and look at this, that difference is not very big. OK. OK, so um, you know, can female directors be superheroes? I would say yes. Right? They have all the qualities uh, that a superhero might uh, exhibit. Um, now, uh, let's uh, another piece of evidence just to sort of show you that this really works. Um, let's look at the finance industry. Okay, you might say, well, in the finance industry, there are more monsters that need fighting. I don't know. Um, but uh, certainly risk taking is really important in the finance industry, right? So um, in the finance industry, are the women more risk averse than the men? Which is the standard story that people say. So people say, well, you know, if more women had been on boards of financial firms, um, then the financial crisis wouldn't have happened, right? Uh, and the reason is that, well, we all know that women take less risk than men. Okay, so let's look at the data. 
So here I have data. This is the same sample from Sweden. Okay. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm only looking at security. Okay, I have other measures of risk. I can do it in different ways. I have um, the same thing. I have Chicago MBA data. I have international data. You get the same pattern. Okay, uh, but this is just the Swedish data. Um, so this is security orientation. And so the less security orientation you uh, security oriented you are, the less risk averse you are. Right? Okay. So this is um, all women. How security oriented they are. And here are the men. Okay, so you see the exact same pattern I showed you before. So women are less security oriented than the men on average. Okay, so they're less risk averse. Uh, now let's cut it by finance and non finance. So you see that um, men in finance are slightly less risk averse than men who are not in finance, but really there's not very much of a difference, right? They're basically the same. Okay, uh, now look at the women. So the women who are in finance, are very much less risk averse than the women who are not in finance. Okay. Now, both of these women, these categories of women, are less risk averse than the men, but particularly the women in finance are less risk averse than the men. Okay. Um, now, I do exactly the same thing here. This is just the raw data, it's just summary statistics. I do the same thing controlling for things like wealth, education, marital status, whether you have kids. Um, and as soon as you control for stuff, uh, you see that this pattern becomes even more striking, right? So women are less risk averse than men on the board, particularly in finance. So the Lehman Sisters story is actually the opposite, right? The women in finance don't take less risk, they take more risk, okay? But that's good because they can be superheroes, right? Okay, so, um, this is actually not correct. Okay. Uh, so uh, just to wrap up on this point, so can women on boards be superheroes? And uh, the answer is yes. So female directors exhibit more superhero values than male directors. And they may exhibit these characteristics even more in finance where risk taking is more important. Okay. So they can be superheroes, right? But are they superheroes? That's the next question. So do female directors save the world? This is actually a very hard question to answer. It seems easy, but it's very difficult. Okay, and there's many challenges. So first, we don't have very good data. How do you measure whether women add value? Okay, very difficult. Um, uh, what kind of methods do you use? Very difficult. Uh, causal inference is a really big problem, and I'll show you later exactly what the issue is. Um, and, um, you know, things like, and I'll get back to this, footnotes that correlation does not prove and imply causation, they simply don't cut it, right? So if you really want to understand whether women add value or not, uh, you can't fall back to sort of footnotes um, and saying, well, we're not really sure about the interpretation. Okay, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, hopefully you will later. Okay, so, um, well, first question we might want to say, well, okay, so women are supposed to save the world. Uh, we think that they can save the world. You know, evidence shows that they can. Um, so, well, in order to save the world, maybe there should be enough women. So let's count how many women are there. That might be the first thing to do. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some standard surveys and say, well, what do they say about how many women there are? And then I'm going to show you some of my own data and say, well, what do I think in terms of how many women there are? Um, and the surveys I'm going to look at are the Catalyst survey. So Catalyst is a very famous survey of women on boards. Um, and it's a survey of board diversity on Fortune 500 firms. Um, currently, they look at S&P um, 500 firms. So this is for the US. Uh, and then um, I'm going to look at the European Union's Gender Balance in Decision-Making Database. Uh, this is a database that the European Union is using to track the progress of women on boards, and this underlies the whole policy discussion at the European Union level. Okay, so this is the database that the European Union uses in order to make, you know, policy in this area. 
Okay. Uh, and what is this database? It's data on board diversity for the largest 50 members of the primary blue chip index in each EU country. Um, and uh, some countries don't have 50 members in the primary index. And so for some countries, there's fewer companies. Okay. Uh, and then I'm also going to look at Credit Suisse. Um, so they have proprietary data on 3,400 companies uh, that their research analysts cover globally. Okay, so I'm going to look at these three surveys and I'm going to compare them to um, our data. And so what we have is uh, we have data from a company called Bordex and um, it's data on unregulated companies in 24 OECD countries from 2001 to 2016. Um, and what we do is uh, we make sure that this data is representative of the country if we include that data in our sample. Uh, so what we say is we only consider a country or we only let a country enter into our sample if Bordex covers at least 70% of market cap of that country. Okay, because we want to get a, a picture of the overall what's going on with women on boards. Okay, so um, let me show you a bunch of graphs. So this is, uh, this right here is Catalyst data. And all it is, is um, it shows you the percent of women on boards in the Catalyst sample. Uh, how they calculate it, it's just the number of women divided by board size. Okay, uh, this is the Catalyst data. And uh, this is our data for the US. Okay, now, you see there's a bit of a problem, right? Because um, this line is significantly lower than that line, right? Um, so who's right? Okay, well, this is a bit of a catalyst, very famous, right? Cited everywhere, everyone's heard of cat, right? I mean, and we're saying, well, actually, um, and you know, this number, uh, so catalyst is saying it's about 20% um, women on boards in the US currently. Okay, this is 2016 ends. Uh, we say it's about 12%. Uh, is that a big difference? It's huge, right? Okay, uh, so that's the US. Uh, what about the European Union? Uh, so this is the European Union data for 16 uh, European countries. Uh, this is our data, this green line here, right? Um, so here, it's not even that um, our line is lower. The growth rate is also lower. Right, so here it's sort of like, well, the growth rate is similar, right? So here it's um, our line is lower and the growth is lower, right? Okay, uh, what about the UK? Okay, so this is a good one. Um, this is the European Union measure. Um, and don't ask me about why it's so funnily shaped. It's, you know, it comes straight from the database. We've double checked it and triple checked it and it's just, um, and this is our measure. Okay, uh, and again, you know, so uh, the, according to the European Union's database, uh, there's roughly uh, 25 or more than 25% women on boards in the UK. Uh, we would say it's about 12%. Is this a big difference? It's huge. Okay. Um, let me uh, pick on poor Japan. Um, so poor Japan has very few women on boards, 3.5%. Uh, uh, this is according to the Credit Suisse report. Um, they say there's 3.5% women on boards. Actually, our numbers are even lower, which, you know, it's hard to believe that you could get lower, but you can. Okay, so these are our numbers. Okay, so what the heck is going on, right? H how come we get such different numbers? Um, so let me just show you another graph. Uh, this graph shows um, the, for the European Union database, the one that underlines all the policy, the number of companies that they have per year uh, in their sample for the entire European Union. Okay, um, so here's 500, right? Um, and you see a very interesting pattern here where um, the number initially goes up and then here it's about constant. Actually, it is constant. Um, and uh, what does that tell you? It's probably they have a fixed budget and they collect the same number of companies every single year, right? I mean, that's an explanation for why you have such a, a line here, right? Okay, so that's the number of companies that are in the European Union uh, data set. Here's a number of companies in our data set, okay? Uh, so I don't know if you can, so this is 500, this is 3,000, right? So we have more than 3,000 companies in our data set as compared to fewer than 500, right? 
Um, so does this matter? Yes, it does, and for a very particular reason. OK, so uh, what, what explains the difference? Uh, so we have more firms, but we have more firms of a very particular type. <coughs> okay, in particular, we have more small firms. OK, uh, so Catalyst, the, the way that they collect their data is they say, we're going to look at the Fortune 500. The Fortune 500, by definition, these are the largest companies in the US. OK, uh, so they have at most 500 of the largest firms in the US. Uh, in our sample, for the US, we have between 1,700 and 4,500 companies. Uh, the European Union is for at most 50 of the largest companies. It's the primary blue chip index in each EU country, right? Um, and generally, they have fewer than 500 companies in their sample. Uh, in our sample alone, we have uh, between 664 and 1,700 firms for the UK alone. So our data for the UK has more companies than the entire European Union database. Okay. And by construction, the European Union database has only the largest companies. Okay. Uh, Credit Suisse. Uh, the, the companies that enter into the Credit Suisse sample require analyst coverage in order to enter the sample. Immediately, you have the largest from companies. Okay. Uh, so what does this tell you? It tells you that um, women are much more likely to sit on the boards of large firms. Okay, so this is important. I'll get back to that. Okay, so uh, do female directors save the world? Um, well, it's sort of like, well, how can they? Right, so uh, there's not that many of them. Actually, there's fewer female directors than people think. And they're all sitting on the boards of large companies. How can you save the world if you're sitting on the board of a large company? Do large companies need like major you know, superheroes? Maybe not, right? Okay, uh, now what about the business case? So you know, the European Commission says, um, indeed there's a clear business case for greater gender diversity, i.e. in terms of individual companies' performance. Okay, so maybe there's not that many women on boards, um, but when they're on the board, boy, they improve company performance, right? So let's see if that holds. Uh, so this right here is um, uh, probably one of the most cited pieces in the policy debate on women on boards. Every policy document that I've ever seen cites this piece. Um, and what it is, it's a one-page document produced by Catalyst, the same company that produces the statistics on women on Fortune 500 uh, boards. Um, and uh, it's called The Bottom Line, Corporate Performance and Women's Representation on Boards. And uh, basically what they do is they take return on equity for the firms in their samples, so this is Fortune 500 companies, and um, they divide the companies into those in the bottom quartile, in terms of women on the board of directors and the top quartile of women on the board of directors. And then they plot return on equity. And you see that return on equity in the bottom quartile of women on boards of directors is much lower than return on equity in the top quartile. Um, and then they say companies with more women on boards of directors outperform those with the least by 53%. So this is the business case argument. Right? And this is the evidence for the business case argument. Okay, so you look at this, you say, wow, you know, women are superheroes. Right? You have a woman on the board and shareholder value goes up. It's incredible. Okay. Um, now here there's this little footnote, correlation does not prove or imply causation. Okay. And that's important because what is this? It's a correlation. Okay, so now it would be great if this was actually true. Okay, because then you know we could all go home. I w we wouldn't have to have these you know discussions. You know, you add a woman to the board, shareholder value goes up. Perfect. The world is great, right? Women can be superheroes, and they are superheroes. Um, but let me show you that it's not the case. Okay, so um, I have some data. So the paper that um, Joe mentioned earlier that's very well uh, cited, uh, this data comes from that paper. And um, if you're going to criticize someone, it's always good to first replicate their results, right? So I took my data, I replicated the catalyst result. Okay. And uh, here's the catalyst result. So I have return on equity, which is what catalyst also uses. And I have the fraction of female directors. 
okay? Uh, so this is a regression, a regress return on equity on the fraction of female directors. Uh, basically, it's the same thing. Since I only have one variable, it's just a correlation. Okay, so what's the correlation? It's positive, and look, three stars. So um, if you know something about statistics, three stars is great. If you don't know anything about statistics, three stars sounds pretty great, right? <laughs> so um, that means, wow, there's, there's really an effect, right? Um, so uh, this seems like, oh, well, Catalyst is right, right? So more women on the board, return on equity increases. Fantastic. Okay, uh, so now before I said, well, where are all the women? Uh, well, the women are all on the boards of large companies, pretty much, right? So now uh, let's think about it. So the women are on the boards of the large companies, and is it possibly the case that large companies might have different performances? Eh, you could tell the story, right? Okay, so what am I gonna do now? I'm gonna put in firm size. So I have log sales, which is a proxy for firm size. I'm gonna put that in this regression. Okay, that's all I do. I add one variable to this regression. What happens? All those magic stars over there, they go to firm size, right? There's no more stars over here. Not only that, this magnitude is a fourth of this, right? So you can't even argue, well, economic significance. Right? So it's not statistically significant, there are no stars. And you can't look at the magnitude and say, well, the magnitude is so big, so still there's something there. No, I'm sorry, it vanished. Okay, and all I've done, I put in one variable. It's firm size. Okay, so now you could do, well, what about something else, right? Okay, so here I have industry effects. Okay, I put an industry effect, I control for industry. Well, actually now the magnitude gets even smaller. 50%. Um, now you could say, well, uh, what about, um, maybe this isn't like a cross-sectional effect, maybe you have to look within firms. So within a firm, if I had more women on the board, uh, does performance increase? That's what I do here. So technically I'm adding firm fixed effects. Whoops, now the sign flips. It's negative. Not only is it negative, now I have my three stars back, but it's the wrong sign, right? So actually, if you, you know, some people might look at this and say, well, actually what this tells us, if you have more women on the board, firm performance goes down. Okay, um, now you can play around, you can put other stuff, right? It's like, oh, what about board size? Okay, I put board size. Uh, what about board independence? Okay, I put board independence. Uh, what about diversification? Okay, you know, throw whatever you want at this thing. Um, and now you put in other stuff and what happens, the stars go away and, um, but the magnitude, you know, the sign is still negative. Okay, so you look at this and you say, well, what's going on, right? And exactly, what's going on? You have no idea, you can't say anything about the relationship between women on boards and firm performance. This is sort of like a classic example of a non-robust result, okay? So, uh, do female directors save the world? Well, female directors have more characteristics of superheroes than male directors. Okay, we can't forget that, right? But they don't save the world. Okay, so now this is really important. Okay, because we want them to be able to, we want that positive correlation to be robust, right? But it's not. So then we have our work cut out for us, right? Because this tells us that um, we need to understand why. I mean, women should be superheroes. Why is that positive correlation not there? That is the interesting question. Okay, so why are female directors not saving the world? Um, well, you could say, well, how is this issue currently being framed? Um, well, currently, the way that people always talk about this is they say, well, you know, women are not on boards because, um, you know, there's something at the company level that's a problem. And um, if you know anything about the policies in this area, all of the gender diversity policies are targeted at firms. You know, so they're all saying, oh, you need to have more women on your board. That's a firm level intervention, right? So you need to do something as a firm. And, um, and the European uh, Commission is quite explicit. They say, well, HR directors are to blame, right? So there's discrimination going on at firms. It's always the firms, the firms, the firms, right? Uh, but it's not that simple. Okay, there's a lot of societal factors that play a role also. 
Um, and um, I don't have that much time, but let me just briefly show you some evidence that suggests that societal factors are important. Uh, so what I've done here is I've taken the same sample that I used to compare against um, Catalyst and um, uh, the European Union data, and I've divided the sample into um, companies in STEM fields and finance and uh, non-STEM field companies. Okay, so what's STEM? It's companies that um, do something related to science, technology, engineering, or math. Okay, and I've defined a STEM firm to be a firm where there's a high proportion of employees um, working in those in sort of technical uh, 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 occupations. Okay, so all I'm doing here is I'm plotting the fraction of women, um, and here this is the non-STEM. Here's the fraction of women uh, in non-STEM firms that are sitting on the board, and here's a fraction of women in STEM firms. This is global, excluding the US. If you look at the US, then you see, and why would one separate? Because the US has a lot of companies. So it's always good to separate out the US. Uh, so the US, you see that both of these lines are higher, but the gap is bigger, right? OK, so basically, what do you see? So there's fewer women on the boards of STEM firms than there are on the boards of non-STEM firms. Um, now you ask, well, is this because the boards of STEM firms, um, they have worse HR directors than the non-STEM companies? Doesn't make much sense because you know, STEM companies, you know, these are like the science companies, they make a lot of money, right? So would they hire worse people? Doesn't make much sense. Um, are they discriminating more? Also hard to tell the story, right? So the STEM field systematically discriminates more than non-STEM field, right? Um, so actually, this suggests that the problem is not at the firm level. There's something related you know, to the pipeline of women in these fields that explains why there's few women um, in the STEM than the non-STEM, right? Um, and if you know anything about this debate, there is a huge debate about um, why women don't enter STEM fields, right? And so basically what this shows you is women don't enter STEM fields, and that has consequences for leadership of STEM firms, right? Because they're going to end up with very few women who are potential board candidates because there's no women in the field, right? But this is not a problem with the directors discriminating um, against women more in STEM fields, it's a problem that there are no women in the field. Okay, and this is not a firm level problem, this is a societal problem. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I won't show you my really cool um, uh, math gap and bank uh, slide, but um, uh, we can talk about it afterwards. Um, okay, so uh, what is the point? Uh, why are female directors not saving the world? Uh, well, it's not just about firms, right? So you can't understand whether women save the world or not just by regressing return on equity and the fraction of women on boards. Okay, we need to dig deeper. We need to understand institutions. So um, do current policies help, right? So do they help overcome some of these potential institutional problems? Um, and here, let me just show you what's going on in the policy space. Uh, so what I have here, this uh, um, solid line, is the number of countries enacting board gender diversity policies over time. Okay, what's a board gender diversity policy? It's a quota. Um, it's a corporate governance code that specifically mentions that uh, directors should consider gender when appointing directors. Um, it's a disclosure rules, like in Australia, you have to disclose um, your diversity policy. Um, it's uh, some state-owned companies have uh, specific quotas. Uh, so those are all board gender policies. Uh, so you see that there's been a lot of activity, right? So many countries are enacting these policies. And as a result, the f this dash line here is the fraction of countries worldwide that have at least one board gender diversity policy. And uh, we're almost up to 25%. This ends in 2016, so I'm sure that we're, you know, more stuff has been happening lately. Um, even California has a quota now, right? So there's more stuff going on. So there's lots of countries now that have these policies. Uh, now, how do they justify these policies? Uh, so let me just read you this. Uh, this comes from the European Commission in 2010. 
Uh, they say, uh, in business, there is an ever-increasing body of evidence showing that companies with a good balance between the sexes at senior level tend to perform better than those that do not. Okay. Um, and I read these documents, I'm always like, oh, well, I want to see which papers are they citing, right? Because you know, my own paper doesn't really find this. So like, which papers are they citing? Uh, always good to look at the footnotes. Um, and here are the footnotes. Uh, so this is the evidence that they cite. Uh, examples of studies linking corporate performance to the representation of women on boards include the bottom line, corporate performance and women's representation on boards, Catalyst 2007, uh, which is the one where I just threw in firm size and the whole thing falls apart, right? Uh, so this is what they're using to justify their policies. And the other one, um, which I can equally uh, destroy, is uh, Women Matter, <laughs> <laughs> Gender Diversity, a Corporate Performance Drive by McKinsey. So the two most cited um, documents in the policy space are the Catalyst Report and the McKinsey Report. Uh, now note, there's not a single academic paper that's cited here. Okay. Um, so you know, you say, well, there's a lot of policy activity going on. Uh, can these policies um, help women become the superheroes they maybe should be? And then I worry a bit when I see how they justify the policies. Um, and, then, and it's not like there aren't any academic papers on this, right? So you might say, well, maybe the policymakers are referring to the business case because there's really no evidence on women on boards. Okay. Now, the, it's a little bit true, but it's not quite that easy. Uh, so what I did is um, uh, I went to look at the, the FT, so the um, Financial Times uh, Top 50 Journal list, and I said, uh, let's get all papers on women on boards. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm plotting the number. So here I have the policies. I just took that from the previous graph. So the number of countries enacting policies. Uh, and here I have the number of papers that were published um, in FT50 journals uh, in each year, specifically relating to uh, women on boards. Um, and um, I'm sort of undercounting these papers a bit because I excluded Journal of Business Ethics, okay? Uh, which is, um, interestingly enough, uh, the journal where most papers about women on boards appear. Um, but, um, you know, if you want to ask me why I exclude it, um, I think they don't do the causation thing very well, okay? Uh, so I've excluded all of the papers from Journal of Business Ethics. So basically, what is this? show you, well, there are papers on women on boards, and they're papers that are published in very good journals. So the FT50 list, this is how we judge you know, the business school. Um, these are very good journals, and there are papers published uh, in these journals. Uh, so why are the policymakers not citing them? It's a bit of a mystery, right? Uh, another problem is uh, what you see is, so their papers published, the policymakers are not citing them. Um, but then there's this explosion in policy, so the policy is front-running the research, right? Because the policy is really taking off before the research even catches on. And I'll bet you that this uptick in the research is all related to the policy, right? Because now, oh, there's all this policy, let's study it, right? And so what this tells you is not like, oh, we understand women on boards, and now let's have a policy. No, it's actually, let's have a policy, oh, now let's study the policy, um, but we still don't know anything about women on boards. Okay. Um, okay, so there's two problems. Uh, so one problem, if you say, well, can current policies sort of um, make women become superheroes? Well, I would say the policies are informed by research, you know, in quotation marks, uh, like Catalyst and McKinsey, which I don't consider fundamental research. Um, they're not informed by research, right, which is what we do at the business school, right? Um, and uh, why is this a problem? Well, the Catalyst story, it's a good story, right? So you add more women to the board and performance goes up, that's a great story, right? But it's wishful thinking, okay? Should you base policy on wishful thinking? I would say not, you know? You may disagree, you know, we can debate this, but I would say that's not a good way to design policy. Uh, and another problem is policies are front-running the research, so there's very little chance that the policies are actually informed, that they're sort of designed around the problem that they're supposed to address. Okay, so um, to conclude, 
uh, I'd like to make the case that fundamental research is necessary to separate truth from fiction. Um, so I think there's a couple of scientific truths, and you know, I'm a bit tough here. I shouldn't, you know, you should never say that you have a truth as a scientist. But so I'm a bit, you know, exaggerating for the sake of the presentation. But um, but what I showed you uh, is that science can tell us that um, there are fewer women out there on boards than people say there are. Uh, women on boards are not as they are typically portrayed. Uh, so the way that women on boards are typically portrayed is not as superheroes. They're portrayed as sort of like, oh, you know, you're going to be the woman who's going to sit in the corner and, oh, let's not do that, right? That's not a superhero. How, how is that person supposed to improve firm performance, right? Uh, so women on boards are not as they're typically portrayed. Um, actually, they are risk-loving. They can be more risk-loving than the men. Right? So when we talk about them as being risk averse, oh, let's have a woman on the board because we're going to reduce risk. That's stereotyping. Okay. Uh, and uh, I didn't highlight this, but um, if you looked at the values, one thing that you really notice is women on boards are very different from men on boards. Okay, now this is very important because a lot of times people have the story, oh, you know, once the women get on the board, they're going to be exactly like the men. Um, if that's the case, there's no reason to have diversity. Right? Because the women and the men are exactly the same. Um, but actually, the values data shows that the women are quite different from the men. So the women are more risk-loving than the men, but they're also more benevolent and significantly more benevolent than the men. OK, so that's a point of differentiation, which is actually important to understand, because that means diversity may matter. OK. Um, but unfortunately, the business case fails. And that's really where the interesting question is, why does it fail? So to conclude, women may not always be superheroes. You know, not always. Most of the time, right? But not always. Um, but there's no reason they can't be superheroes more often, right? They have all the fundamentals. Uh, and informed policies may actually help, right? So there, there's some reason that they're not realizing their potential. We don't really know what it is, but presumably policy can help um, them achieve their potential. Um, and so basically, I'd like to say, so for those of you who are still looking for research topics, if there's anyone in the room, we need more research. Um, so that line that I showed you with the policies and the research, it's a bit outrageous, right? We, we need to like get cranking on this. We need to understand what's going on. Um, and also, policymakers and academics need to engage, right? So they should start citing our work. We need to engage with policymakers. Only then can women actually become superheroes. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Rennie, for a very fascinating talk. I didn't realize there were so many different um, components to it. It's very interesting. And I'm also heartened by the fact, and hopefully um, you all are, that you know, hopefully we've all got some superhero values within us. I'm going to think of myself as a superhero um, going forward. Has anyone got any questions for Rene? Over there. Um, so I have actually two questions. One is about sort of risk aversion being a, oh, risk aversion being a good trait and how sort of Credit Suisse misinterprets some bad um, traits of men as risk aversion, like referring to, for example, overconfidence in men and their sh um, trading behavior, etc. So perhaps it's kind of just unpacking or just sort of um, putting in the box of risk aversion a lot of other behavioral traits. And actually, it's just a misinterpretation of the term risk averse. Um, yeah. They're probably, you know, um, I mean, yeah, like, not overly confident, they know their um, abilities well, etc. The second question is about, I mean, and, and coming to this talk, I was thinking, oh, of course, there must be a problem more deep down in the education levels, like in the education system, how many women go into STEM, how many women actually go into getting up to the boards, because the women on, on boards have already made it, but so few of them have made it. What are the policies that sort of 
prevent women from going up there? And I, I guess it's a very big question about policy, right? Education and, you know, sort of more lower level employment related maternity, et cetera, et cetera. But I suppose your research doesn't necessarily pinpoint one of those multiple things. So that's my question. Yeah, so those are big questions, right? Um, so the first question, um, yeah, I think your point is well taken. So, but I think this is a problem for the whole area, right? So people talk about risk aversion; they're not precise in what they mean, right? Um, and but but so one thing that really bugs me is uh, people throw these labels around very easily, and they don't understand when they're stereotyping. Okay, so so one of my favorite ones, for example, is um, this idea that women shy away from competition. Okay, so there's a lot of research showing that women shy away from competition, but these women are like students at universities. These are not women who sit on boards, right? And then people start telling the story. Oh, we all know that women shy away from competition, right? Um, now, I don't know how, uh, if any of you have ever um, uh, seen a ballet company, or um, I mean, like ballet is the most competitive sport probably ever. Right? And I'm just like, okay, you, you have no idea. So it, it really depends on the context, right? So context really matters for these things. And so the, I think a very important point is that one shouldn't um, get to these labels too quickly, right? And so the overconfidence thing, yeah. So maybe people are saying, well, women are not as overconfident as men, right? And then, what they, and then they say, well, that's risk aversion. Okay, and maybe you like the story that women are not as overconfident as men. Um, but uh, then you have to say, well, men are generally overconfident, and actually, I'm not sure. Are men generally overconfident? I don't know. And are women less overconfident, especially at the board level? I don't know, right? Um, so to be a woman on a board, uh, you might have to be more overconfident than the men, right? I mean, you've got to be super confident. So, so I don't know, right? So, but interesting research question, right? Uh, but I think it's very important that we don't stereotype. Um, and then uh, the second question, what are the factors that lead to women not being on boards? Well, I have some research um, where we, we show that, um, so the, the data that we used, uh, or that I showed you a bunch of statistics from, uh, we use that to show that um, countries uh, have more women sitting on boards when more women work full time in the country. Okay. Uh, now you say it, it's completely obvious, right? Um, but then you start thinking it has many policy implications. Because if you really want more women to sit on boards, suppose that's a desirable policy objective, um, then what's one way to achieve it? You need more women to work full time. Okay, and then how do you get more women to work full time? Well, then you start thinking about childcare, right? You start thinking about culture. You start thinking, I mean, there's many things, right? Education. Right, so, so it's a complicated problem. Uh, it's a complicated problem, and um, in my view, we're only throwing simplistic solutions at it. Yeah. Um, do I manage it, or? Yeah, good, you manage it, because. You might have mentioned this, I apologize. What was your sample size of the, the directors, the female directors? Uh, in Sweden? Yeah. Uh, you mean the, the values? What was the sample size? No, but which, which sample size? I had several samples. For, the, the values? for determining um, women are less risk averse, women on boards are less risk averse. Okay. So How many we had, women um, directors were in the sample size? Okay, so we had about uh, 650 directors overall and about 20% women. So was it a st statistically significant sample size in your opinion? Yes. So the difference between men and women in terms of risk aversion is statistically significant. Okay. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I have other samples. Um, so and do you think there's, because it, it was only women directors in Sweden, do you think there was any cultural bias? Um, sure. So actually, uh, I would argue that the results we find are understated. Okay. Uh, I would expect that if we did the same thing for the U.S., we would find a bigger difference. Okay. And so what's our story? So, um, so the paper that we wrote, we actually argued that uh, one reason that we find this flip is because of selection, right? So it's hard for women to get to the board. Right, and so you you need to exhibit more characteristics um, uh, in a certain way. Like you need to be more risk seeking than the men in order to get there. Right. I would, as a female director and chairman of boards, I would completely agree with you. Yeah. Um, just as an aside. But then um, the cultural issue comes in because then we said, well, Sweden is very egalitarian, right? So if we find this effect in Sweden, well, imagine what we would find elsewhere. 
Right. right. That would be very and so we we actually have some research now where we um, we have data on this across countries. Um, and we're going to write a paper on that, but we haven't fully analyzed well, it. Well, I, I look forward to that. That will be fascinating and very interesting. Do you mind, could we just ask how many people in the room, uh, women in the room, have ever sat on a board or been a director? Okay, excellent. Great. Thank you. It was fascinating. Okay, thanks. Lady in the stripy shirt up there. Thank you very much for calling out the stripy shirt. Um, so thank you very much for your, your talk. In, in many ways, we, we can't smile because it is quite controversial. And in many ways, it's a bad news message for women. Um, if we're saying there's no real overall benefit to women being on boards, then where does that leave us practically as women? So just a couple of comments. The first one is that in a way, it shows that there's been a positive government intervention at some level, because essentially they've ignored the reality and still said, let's set some quotas, let's get more women on boards. Do you agree with that or not? Um, and another level, it says, I know obviously we want to do more research in this area, but essentially it says, well, let's limit research in this area or just go with what we want as, an, as a potential outcome. So my questions are, what do you personally think about the idea of positive selection, i.e. positively, you know, let's say all women shortlists or positively selecting just for gender? Um, and then the second thing is, should we then as women just go for a neutral playing field? Yes, the, 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 you know, you, what you're talking about is being superheroes, but actually surely shouldn't we just be going for being the same is enough, i.e. women should just have a level playing field in terms of being on boards. What are your thoughts on those two, please? Okay, there were a lot of questions there, so um, I got lost. I'm not very good at keeping questions in my mind. Okay, so the first thing, um, let me just clarify though. Um, you may think that this, that this is bad news, right? Um, but actually what I'm saying, it's very difficult to measure um, value increases, right? Um, and so my standard story, so like suppose you were taking some random you know, corporate finance class, right? And someone told you, well, um, you know, should your CEO do a merger, right? Uh, and you look at the evidence on M&A, you would say, I mean, there's no, I mean, the evidence is totally all over the place. Okay, so, so the evidence for women on boards is exactly the same. Right? So I would say there is no corporate strategy uh, for which you would unambiguously say that it adds value. Because it could add value, but it could not add value. It depends. Women is exactly the same. Okay. So now a problem is, why are we setting a standard for women that you can't apply to any other corporate strategy? Right? So why do we say that the only reason to have a policy for women on boards is if we believe that they magically add shareholder value? Um, I think that's a very bad basis for policy making. Okay, um, and it, it may be that women add value, right? Uh, it's just measuring it is very difficult. So you know that's why we need more research because we really need to get it um, at these issues. So so I just wanted to set it straight. So I don't I don't view this as bad news. I view this as like uh, let's be scientists because the only way that we can actually change the world is by understanding what's actually going on, right? Um, okay, so now um, your list of questions. Um, um, positive, positive selection. What do you think about positive selection? Uh, oh, so uh, should we have lists of all women? Um, well, uh, you know what? I think it's good to shake things up, um, and um, why not occasionally, right? Um, so I've had a just to tell you a story. So, um, so in finance, I'm a finance professor, right? Um, in finance, uh, once you once you get focused on the gender thing, you see it everywhere, right? So in finance, most conferences, the men are presenters. The program committee, it's all male. The keynotes are always male, right? So, um, so I organized a conference where I said, I can, I'm going to have only female keynotes. I'm going to have an only female selection committee, so the people who choose the papers. Uh, but any can, anyone can submit a paper, right? So, so I, as a woman, can submit a paper uh, to a conference run by men, and the men can submit to the conference run by women, right? Um, and the interesting thing is a lot of guys didn't submit because they thought it was a conference only for women. Even though the, it was a standard finance conference, it just happened to be that the keynote was female and the program committee was female. So. Um, so it was an, in, an interesting thing, but like, why not, right? So I don't know. I don't think I have a rule about this, right? Um, and then uh, other question was about just as far into a neutral playing field. Then if it's if there's no positive causal benefit, then surely just from the spirit of fairness and the number of 
you know, women and men in the world, we should just be going for a neutral, even playing field. Oh, uh, okay. No, um, so, no, but, um, so I'm a big believer in diversity. I'm a major believer in diversity. So just because you don't see return on equity increasing when there's more women on boards, doesn't mean diversity doesn't add value, right? And so actually a lot of the evidence that I showed sort of suggests that, right? So women are quite different from men. So of course we should have diverse teams, right? Um, what we shouldn't do is apply a standard that we can't apply to any other corporate strategy to women. Right, so we shouldn't say, well, the only reason to have diversity is if we can measure it using a return on equity increasing. Right, why, why would we impose this standard? Okay, so in theory, diversity matters. Now, in practice, measuring whether diversity matters is very difficult, but it's also very difficult for any other corporate strategy. Okay, so I think that's really, you know, something that, you know, so, you know, the catalyst stuff, is a story, and then you might say, well, maybe Catalyst isn't so bad, but actually it is bad. And the reason that it's bad is because, um, you know, understanding that the business case may fail helps us try to understand where the problems are. You know, so, so you may say, well, you know, it's very hard to measure if something doesn't add value, but then in the M&A literature, what you do is you say, well, when, does, when do mergers add value? What are the characteristics of mergers that add value? So you d there's a huge literature on M&A because you try to figure out why doesn't it add value, right? And so for the, for the diversity, it should be the same. We should be writing lots of papers trying to say, well, maybe in this situation, having more women adds value, and what is the characteristic, you know, but it can't be the case that it's always good to have women. Just like it's not the case, it's always good to have men, right? So, so um, level playing field? No, I mean, like, why would you, right? I mean, you should be, you should do what you, what the, whatever your thing is, right? We've got time for two more questions. One from yep. over here. So I like the correlation um, with the return on equity, but uh, we are sort of moving from maximizing shareholder value to stakeholder value. And we are saying um, now ESG factors and everything else, uh, including stewardship codes and everything now are revolving around stakeholder value and not just. So would that in any way strengthen the argument for or give a different perspective to women on boards um, in, in research, for example. I don't know how much research has been done there. Yeah, well, um, actually, um, the same Swedish sample uh, that I showed you the values from, so we also wrote another paper where we were actually measuring how stakeholder-oriented directors were. And uh, what we found is that the women were more stakeholder-oriented. Okay. However, in other countries, that may not be the case. Okay. Um, which again suggests that context matters, right? And so Sweden is a very egalitarian country, right? Uh, the women who are on boards are very stakeholder oriented. Uh, now, suppose you said, well, would a, would a director, a female director in the US sitting on a Fortune 500 company board, um, would she be more interested in the stakeholders than the men who are on the Fortune 500? And then you might say, well, maybe not, because maybe it's, you know, maybe she has to be tougher than the men, right? So, I mean, you know. But, um, but the whole stakeholder debate, of course, this is important, right? Um, and you, know, you, could even, you could even argue, if you wanted to, you could say, well, actually, uh, you, know, you don't see that the shareholder value goes up when you add more women on the board, uh, because actually they're not interested in maximizing shareholder value. They're looking at stakeholders or whatever, right? So now the question is, how do we measure that? Um, and we can't even measure shareholder value properly, and now we've got to measure stakeholder value, so it's like, you know, but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, stakeholders is exactly about diversity, right? And so I think it's, it's a very important, you know, argument for saying we need more women on boards, right? But then make that argument, don't do this business case thing, right? Final one. Up there, second, third row. Here. Thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned institutions as well as firms. Um, I know it may be harder to quantify, but uh, would you say the visibility of women as leaders in other institutions is important? For example, um, the previous Bodley's librarian here was the first female uh, Bodley's librarian, present vice chancellor at Oxford University is a woman. 
the leader of the government is a woman and the monarch is a woman. I don't know how those things could affect the status of women. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I would think it's important, but um, I hate to be depressing or more depressing, <laughs> even though you shouldn't be depressed. Um, but uh, so the Norwegian, I don't, I don't know if you're very familiar with the Norwegian gender quota, but um, in Norway in 2008, uh, the Norwegian government decided that we're gonna have a gender quota. Um, and it's interesting because in Norway, they didn't make this business case argument. They said, it's just the right thing to do. Okay. Um, and so the, the gender quota is for 40% women. Okay, and then later everyone came and said, oh, you know, it's so great because now more women are gonna go into business and blah, blah, because you have all these role models, right? All the women sitting on boards. Okay, um, now there's a, a paper that just got published in a very good journal by excellent academics who understand what they're doing um, and they found no effect. So they didn't find um, that there was sort of more promotion of women within organizations uh, with more women on boards because of the quota. They didn't find that um, there seemed to be changes in educational outcomes for the girls uh, because there was a quota. So um, now you could argue it may be too soon because 2008, you know, 10 years essentially, maybe that's not enough time. Um, so there could be positive effect. I mean, personally, I think we all know cases where we say, wow, this person is really inspiring, and then that inspired, right? So there's personal inspiration. Yeah, I think it can be very motivating. Um, but it seems like it's maybe, at least for Norway, didn't have quite the effect that people thought. Thank you. I know that there are lots more questions that people want to ask, so please continue uh, the discussion over drinks. Before we uh, finally finish, I just want to give a big um, plug for some of our other events that are coming up um, over the course of the next month. On Friday morning, you are all very welcome to our special um, International Women's Day breakfast. And at this breakfast, we are going to be launching a limited edition um, online career tool. Um, it's only available for a very um, limited amount of time. So please make sure you come along to that. Um, and then um, we have got uh, Judith McKenna. Um, who's going to be coming to the school to talk about transformation in a time of change on the 26th of March. But there are lots and lots of other activities going on, lots of career development talks um, and other events by our students. So please keep checking um, our website. Um, but to finally finish, thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. <laughs>